Today's episode is sponsored by Liberty Language Services and its new sister company, the Academy of Interpretation, that launched in early 2022. The Academy of Interpretation is an online education and learning platform for the language services industry. The AOI's mission is to expand access to educational courses while establishing a standard of quality and professionalism. They do this by bringing language service providers, content creators, and students together on an online platform that's accessible to everyone. The Academy of Interpretation was founded to address the widespread problem of untrained interpreters working in the field. The AOI offers professional accredited courses for interpreters and serves as a platform for organizations to refer their interpreters for training. The AOI is offering Brand the Interpreter listeners a 10% discount on all courses using the discount code AOI10BTI. This code cannot be combined with any other discounts. But check out the episode show notes for more information about the Academy of Interpretation or visit their website at www.academyofinterpretation.com. Liberty Language Services is a rapidly growing language service company that recently celebrated 11 years of providing language access services. And they are currently hiring freelance interpreters for a variety of languages. To find out more about Liberty or to apply, Check out the episode notes. Mila, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh, absolutely. You know, uh, Mila, when I first met you, it was over at ATA 62nd Conference last year in October uh, in Minneapolis. And just real quick before we even begin, I remember sitting in this group of amazing female entrepreneurs, super successful. And if I could be super honest, I felt very out of my element, very out of place in, in, in this circle, but I was just enjoying the conversations and yours in particular struck me so much because of the stories that you were sharing. And I knew I had to invite you on the show. So again, thank you for being here. And I'm extremely excited for today's conversations. I appreciate the invite. And it was one of the very first in-person events after COVID, right? So everybody was so excited to get together. It was great. It was amazing. I, that, I will remember that night forever. I'd like to begin by asking you, Mila, to take us back down memory lane and share with us, what did you aspire to be when you grew up? So I was growing up in the Soviet Union you know, which is now Russia, and it's not the, the most popular country today. And um, actually, I'm very ashamed about what's going on. But when I was growing up, it was behind the Iron Curtain. So one of the things was all of the information, all of the communication was controlled by the government. And one of my big voids was being able to have access to, to information. The only place you could get information other than what was government control was by listening to shortwave radio or getting potentially some quote unquote illegal books uh, that, that were not allowed uh, by the government. So um, my big aspiration in life was how can we give people access to to information how can we give people access to to knowledge so connecting people across language and culture is to me also connecting people to information to education to to knowledge to to freedom to democracy in a way so it's that that's became my my life's journey that's amazing. And to think that sometimes when people are deprived of information or um, content, things of that nature, that, you know, your, your world may seem pretty small. How did you at such a young age determine that there was more to the world than what you were exposed to? 
Well, um, we all knew that there's more to the world than what we were exposed to. We all knew that there were outside countries and, and I didn't believe uh, what the media was particularly showing at the time. So um, it, it was, there was a lot of people who, who were kind of in the same boat mm. as me. Those are those conversations amongst each other that you knew. Yeah, our mind is amazing, I think, in, in, in figuring that out and determining for ourselves, uh, you know, that there's more, especially if your heart is connected to your mind. I totally, I totally believe that, um, you know, we aspire for more thanks to that connection. I, I'm curious to know, what is something that you have a fond memory about growing up? Something uh, wherever you grew up or where did you grow up and what was a fond memory of that? Oh, I grew up in Moscow. Um, I grew up in Moscow and I have a lot of uh, a lot of fun memories, of, of course. And so, um, oh gosh, that's uh, taking me back. Well, one of the things I love is every, and actually I do that uh, now every time that I travel or go to a new country or, or I, I love walking around the city, just walking on foot and looking at the architecture, looking at the people, looking at the history. There's a completely different way when you go to a new city, like New York, for example, right, or um, Barcelona, or, or even any, any small town as well, you, you get to feel the city through walking the streets, mm -hmm. and looking at, you know, what what happens, and, and in a way from your own perception, right, you're looking at the little merchants, you're looking at the way people talk, interact, and learning the city, getting to know the city that way. So that was one of my fondest memories that I kind of carried through life. I'm curious, at the age of 19, Mila, you come to the U.S. Walk us through that experience and that how that came to be. Um, I was very, very lucky. I was um, able to, to come to the U.S. as um, I actually came a, a, because a, a group of, of tourists bought me a ticket that was at the time when things first opened up, we were allowed to travel. It was before the wall, a few months before the wall. Uh, Berlin Wall fell, and um, U.S. was welcoming everybody. And um, so I had a, a group of American tourists that basically pitched in and, and bought me a ticket. And uh, ran, random coincidence. And then I ended up in this country. I applied for, for college, and I, I got accepted, which was very lucky experience for me. But 19 uh, was, in a way, a blessing. That's when you don't think a lot. <laughs> because you don't think you, you're not afraid. So I, I didn't have any fear. I was just wanting to get away from being behind the iron curtain from being behind whatever the system was um, and um, to see if I can um, come to, to this country to, to study. That was my biggest objective. So phenomenal to think that uh, when the opportunity presented itself, however it presented itself, in this case, a group of tourists, how amazing, open up that door and, and you walk through it. And it's so true. And we're so young, we don't consider necessarily the risks and we tend to lose that the older we get. Unfortunately, I suppose it is unfortunate because then that keeps us from doing many other potential great things. Did you always want to come to the U.S. to go to school or was just. Oh, that was my that was my dream. Yeah, that was I was absolutely my, my dream to to get from out from behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah. So talk to us then about you come at such a young age to a completely new country, a completely different culture. What was that like for you? Oh, first of all, um, it was a big culture shock that I discovered that it was not ev not every town in America uh, looked like Manhattan, because one of the things that got portrayed is, you know, you have skyscrapers everywhere and fast cars. And then um, so it was a big culture shock coming to, um, you know, a lot of small town America was 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 what I've discovered, which was beautiful in a way. Um, it was really um touched by the warmth of the people and um, the curiosity of the people and, and how many opportunities this country actually allows people to have. Here, anybody who works hard can succeed. And to me, um, that, is, that is so beautiful. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there's a lot of challenges, but compared to at least where I was coming from, 
um, it, it was it was beautiful. Yes, and you're a walking example of the opportunities that you you take advantage of and leverage and be, make something of it. And we're going to get into what that snowballed and ended up becoming for you. Um, but a, a little bit more with regards to the experience. Now, when you went to school, you went to school focusing on what? I went to school focusing on finance. Um, again, because from my experience, when I was growing up, international studying international finance was closed for women. Uh, one of the uh, interesting facts about the Soviet Union, it was promoting the fact that women and men are, are equal. Everybody has equal rights, equal opportunity. That was happening on paper. So, for example, um, girls, like, like they would have much smaller quota for girls to be able to, to study international finance. So there was a lot of closed doors. You, you wouldn't even be um, admitted or considered. I don't know. They would have uh, 30 spots for guys and, and one spot or two spots for girls for um, to enter a particular field. So I wanted to come and, and study the field that was at least closed for me or what I thought was closed for me, international finance. And that's what landed me at the University of Houston. And uh, yeah. when I was at the university, I signed up for an elective class that I had no idea what it meant, entrepreneurship and, and some words, you know, the new words for me, you know, coming from the planned communist economy. But it was an elective that, that fit my schedule. The interesting part, this was also the first year entrepreneurship was taught at the University of Houston. Uh, now it's the Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship. And uh, they've been ranked continuously as one of the top uh, entrepreneurship programs in the nation. At the time when I came in, it was the very first class. Uh, taught by uh, Bill Sherrill, uh, who believed that entrepreneurship could be taught. And, uh, you know, the consensus was at that time that nobody can teach entrepreneurship. So it was, in a way, uh, a beautiful experience in many ways. And uh, part of the, uh, one of the assignments in the class was uh, you need to write a business plan. Well, being a typical typical student um, and, uh, and working and taking a lot of um, classes um you know there was the night before and uh, i have to write a paper on on the business plan and uh, i was thinking about what business plan could that be um i don't know you you have big dreams you know starting a new manufacturing plant or starting a new um, business in in uh, energy or environmental and time crunch and I go, okay, I know languages, so let's look at it. Starting a translation company. And, and so I put in together a quick uh, few points for, for the initial project, then uh, realized I was going to have to work on that project for the rest of the semester. And then that put me on the discovery where I learned that, oh my God, that's an industry. And at that time, it was a much smaller industry. And, uh, and I said, I, I can... It's an industry that exists. Uh, I can be part of that industry. So I started learning about it and I was already doing interpreting. I was working as an interpreter, uh, you know, kind of freelance work and occasional doing translation work. So um, then um, that homework assignment became my, my lifelong project. Oh my gosh. And Boy, do we have so much uh, to talk about with regards to that. But I'd like to go back a little bit um, and, and rewind a little bit with the language aspect. You came here uh, with Russian as your primary language. When did English come into the picture for you? Was it while you were still uh, out uh, in Russia or was that once you came here? Um, in, in Russia, people study a foreign language. So starting many, many schools start in, in second grade a foreign language. So for me, it was English. And, and I always had, I wanted to learn another language because another language opens an opportunity in, into another culture. So also along the way, I started learning French. So I was learning English, uh, Russian and French. And um, reading everything I could put my hands on in those languages because it opened the doors beyond the, the Iron Curtain, beyond the, you know, limited, I think we had three or four channels on TV mostly showing the, the government news or um, the, the communist propaganda, you know, type things or movies about 
World War II or just very limited um, access to to things. I mean, and come to think about it, some works of Dostoevsky were not allowed to, to read, even some works of Lenin were forbidden for people to, to read. So there was a lot of things that we were not allowed to, to read or have access to. And once you came here to the States, what was that like? What, like I'm, I'm imagining you walking into a library for some reason, like what was well, that like? So I had very interesting experience in my, in my English class, actually. So I, I was failing my first English essay class uh, because I did not know how to write. And I did not know how to write because I was used to, we would, we would be given a topic and then the teacher on the board would write what we're supposed to think. And everybody was supposed to think a certain way. You couldn't deviate. You had to develop the topic from a certain angle that was allowed. And uh, here the teacher said, here's a book you're supposed to read, uh, write an essay. And I said, I don't, what am I supposed to think? And she said, what are your thoughts? I said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And she said, well, go and put yourself, figure it out. What are your thoughts? And, and, and write an essay in it. So that I had a big struggle with that, that I did not know how to even compose my own thoughts about a book without that being posted on the board. So there was a big culture shock from that perspective as well. That's amazing. And I'm picturing you now coming in from a, a place of very limited opportunity, even though they were, you know, saying like, like you mentioned that there was um, the, the opportunity was equal for both male and female. You come to the States and you take this course that's brand new on, on entrepreneurship. How many females were in that class? Do you recall? Uh, there were quite a few. I, I didn't recall any any big difference. That's that's another thing. I didn't recall anybody not who didn't want to go not going. There, it was probably 50-50 or maybe 40-60. So there wasn't any big differentiator. So you felt like you were in, definitely in the right place, I imagine. How did your opportunities come to be then uh, with regards to interpreting and translating? Because now you're in school and you'd mentioned earlier, by then you had done a couple of, of uh, gigs with interpreting and translation. How did that opportunity come to be? Well, the opportunity came to be actually University of Houston hosted one of the very first delegations that came from, from Russia for, for oil and gas. And um, I had the opportunity to volunteer as an interpreter. And that opened opportunities because people started asking me if I could then help interpret. Russia was first opening up as a market. So there were oil and gas companies looking into Russia. NASA started looking at the joint uh, space program project. So a lot of different things and, uh, started happening. And so there was, um, I was needed. And um, uh, that, that's how I started doing interpreting. Yeah. And I like that because it's like, it gives you, uh, it gives us a little bit of insight as to how the thought even developed for your project. And earlier you had mentioned, you know, it's, you liked languages. And so coming from, you know, having learned a, a couple of languages and now you've got, you know, your trilingual and you're trying to come up with this idea of, for a project, which if I'm not mistaken, I might have heard that in someone else too, that it, it was developed as a school project, like almost like a challenge, right? And and then it just, it, it grew from there. I, I'm interested in, in, in knowing it in terms of that particular idea, um, Mila, what did you find out as you were doing more of the discovery in order to write that paper the night before, by the way, <laughs> what were you discovering that interested you even more? Well, I discovered that it was an industry, that it wasn't a random request. And one of the things that, that shocked me at the time is I went more and more into it. And then I started being called uh, to interpret at the medical center because they had, you know, patients that were coming in who were Russian speaking. Uh, one of the things that shocked me was that anybody could interpret. Um, in the Soviet Union, when I was growing up, it, it, it was very controlled again, and you had to have an education to interpret. You had to have completed certain levels of education, even to work as a bilingual tour guide. You had to have completed a five-year college program to be able to work 
as an interpreter in that setting. And here, if you just speak the language, you could, you could go. So that was, uh, and many times I would find myself not knowing the terminology, not knowing what I'm talking about. Um, that was before cell phones, right? You couldn't, you had to bring dictionaries with you. Uh, not, the, or cell phones were already there, but we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have the iPhone where we have access to, to every um, information out there, piece of information on the web. So um, as a result of that, I got very involved in professional development, and I have seen how, uh, especially in the interpreting field, we have formed professional organizations, requirements, uh, certifications um, for, for this country, and, and I think uh, it's been incredibly watching that happen, and also the evolution of uh, from uh, where providing an interpreter, especially with, with the Title VI, uh, providing the interpreter became a requirement, part of where hospitals now, courts now, schools now actually um, provide interpreters to enable language access. So that's been a, a very beautiful thing to see, because I, I see language rights as, as human rights on the same level. And to me, access to information is, is critical. I see that, or I read, we will read that 40% of the world don't have access to education in their native language or in the language that they understand. And as a result, you'll see a, more, a horrifying number, something like 170 million people feed into extreme poverty as opposed to even poverty because they don't have ability to learn. Then you look at and you see that there is a huge um, gap where uh, to dig access to digital information. You may see, for example, uh, people like, um, I don't know, German people, right? They have access, they can, you can turn on the internet in German or Norwegian people that can turn into a, a internet in, in their language. But if you're a speaker of Mayan, your language is not even digitized. And we're, we're talking about 6 million people. If you're a speaker of Fulani, and I believe it's about 70 million people in Africa, your language, you don't have no meaningful digital presence on the internet, if any. I know people are working on it. So we have huge number of people who are excluded completely from the world like you and I know it, where you can turn on the computer, where you can Google something, where you can go to Wikipedia, where you can pull up a textbook. Um, there is a huge divide um, with, that exists with regards to access to information. And, and we as a language industry have the ability to really make a difference for, uh, for that part of the world uh, for for all people to get access to learn. Yeah, and it sounds like you definitely uh, were able to recognize a need and, and not just recognize it, but also to fill it, um, which is how your company was created. So it didn't just become an idea on paper for a school project from a class that Fit your schedule. It didn't just stay there and live there. And you actually developed this idea into fruition, into something that is now a multi-million dollar company, which is just phenomenal. And for all of the female uh, soon-to-be entrepreneurs out there, I'd like to get started in this conversation with regards to that journey of yours, because oftentimes we talk about the journey as it being linear, when in fact, there were so many challenges and hurdles along the way that we have to learn to overcome or find mentors to help us to overcome. So I'd like to get started on the on the topic, Mila, of how you made this into fruition. Where did you even begin? Well, funny story there, one of uh, my first or well, my very first employee came to me for her paycheck at the end of every day because she had that much confidence that we would still be in business tomorrow. <laughs> so just in, case. <laughs> just in case, let's get paid today. Um, you know, if we still have a job tomorrow, uh, you kind of start one step at a time, right? And, and um, well, the important thing is to always have a plan. So you, 
you sit down and you go, what does it look like? So I actually created a plan and on my plan, I looked at what it would look like when we are a $40 million company. And that's where the plan took us to. And I, you st I started from there. What kind of dreaming big? What does it look like when we're at 40 million? And then taking it back, taking it down to step one. I don't even have a single employee. What do I need? I need a phone line at the time. I need a fax machine at the time. You, you need to go buy paper. Do I have money for a computer? So working out those small details and doing how do you get a first customer? How, how do you learn how to sell? I don't know how to sell. Um, how do you promote yourself? Um, I remember joining um, every single organization. At one point, I was attending tire dealers and retreaders association meeting, going, maybe they do business internationally, and then going, oh, no, I'm completely out of place, you know, in, in, in here. So you start networking, you start going to the events, you learn things one thing at a time. And then suddenly you, you kind of have to learn everything, right? You have to learn marketing, you have to learn sales, you have to learn accounting, because um, that issuing that very first invoice, and then uh, figuring out how to, to file taxes. Um, you have to learn how to, to talk to people than actually doing the job once you do the job. So it's very much resembling playing tennis with yourself. You know, you hit the ball, you run to the other side, you pick up the ball, you hit the ball, and then <laughs> back. Um, so a lot, of, um, a lot of hard work that way. And um, the beautiful and interesting thing is it's never stopped because at every level, um, you're still kind of figuring it out. Um, but as long or and as long as or but and but as long as you love what it is that you do, mm -hmm. you never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And my big driver is connecting people to to information, to knowledge, to education, to healthcare, to um, opportunity. It makes me think of the story of uh, Jeff Bezos, um, CEO of Amazon, when he first uh, thought of the name of the uh, company uh, as as what I read, uh, Cadabra, right, as in ab Abracadabra. And his attorney said, that's, you know, it's just not, it's, it's not as clear. Um, and I remember reading him saying somewhere around the lines of let's just file status with the name and we can think of an actual name later. And then he and then he found the name or was inspired by the word or name Amazon because he's going down the A's uh, in the dictionary. <laughs> so it's an example of, you know, like you you start messy and you figure it out along the way. And the important thing here is to start is what I'm hearing. Right. Um, all these other components you can learn along the way. What was your inspiration behind the name Master Word? Oh, it's a really funny story, actually. Um, it was, um, I was working a, as a freelancer in a project with um, a large oil and gas company. And um, there was another freelancer in the room with me. And the, the gentleman representing the company, there was a Russian delegation coming. We would be interpreting starting next week. It was something like Wednesday. The delegation was be there Monday. And so this gentleman pokes his head through the door, conference room door, and he goes, they just told me from legal, we can no longer work with individuals. And I go, we'll have a corporation by Monday. And he goes, okay. Pokes his head back in, goes, what's your corporation name? And the first words that came out of my mouth was Microsoft. And everybody started laughing, goes taken. And I go, M, 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 master word. So that was literally on the wow. spot. Because I had 30 seconds. And, and then he said, fine, I'll tell legal. So then I ran to uh, Office Max, Office Depot, whatever that was called. And I picked up a self-incorporation package. Um, you know, incorporate. And I started reading it. How do I file? What do I incorporate? And I um, called somebody I knew and he let me borrow his uh, paperwork for a Desdemona cattle company. And I said, good. 
So it was me combining whatever was on the shelf with the Desdemona Cattle Company uh, corporate documents <laughs> and, and filing it by Monday. Later, actually, an, a professional attorney looked at that. He goes, oh, my God. And so it's like, <laughs> who did that? I go, I did that. <laughs> it got me started. <laughs> but we had a corporation by Monday. <laughs> wow. I love that. I love that story so much, especially the fact that something came to you so quickly and you did not change the name. How long have you been in business for Mila? Uh, start, uh, incorporated officially February 12th, 1993. And so, and, and the name is actually a beautiful name. It's master it of the word. So it's, uh, it's just amazing how you have several seconds and it just pops up and in a way it's perfect. That's so perfect. I don't know that I could have come up with the title of my company so quickly. I think I would have overthought that and perhaps even lost my opportunity there. You start in a very male dominant industry when it comes to um, business, you would say, right, Mila, even though the language industry, we could say, is um primarily females that that are running the show you know if I if I could say that um what was that like for you what was one of those challenges that you felt walking into such a male dominant industry well I started also serving and supporting oil and gas which is pretty much still very male dominant today that was my my first experiences the um, um and i want to bring up the point that if you read the uh industry summary i believe nimsy published the numbers on how few companies in the top 100 are women run or, or women owned which is a little bit of a shock to me because it's such a women dominant industry so i'd love to see more of us uh stepping up to to the plate in a way um that the and back to your question um, it was again, um, lack of, I, I didn't think about it. I didn't think about it twice. I just did it. And um, how many times was I dismissed in, in a meeting at, at a business event where I was trying to network, um, you know, I'm trying to network and somebody passes me a cup of coffee or takes me for the, the, the staff that's supposed to serve drinks. So I would just serve the drink and I'd get to the meeting and go and <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here talking to you about this. Enjoy it. <laughs> right. So right. The, um, I've also uh, had, um, I, I guess, a blessing in a way of um, working in, uh, in, in the Middle East or in, in different cultures or encountering different cultures that are uh, very, uh, even more traditionally male, male dominant. Mm -hmm. The thing that, that helped is instead of, in a way, fighting it, I, I kind of went with it, you know, like water, be flexible, like water, Bruce Lee, that's what kind of stayed in my mind. And I can serve a coffee drink, or I can stand in the back of the room. Um, but I'm still going to get my point across. So sometimes I would do the tactic as I would wear the brightest suit in the room, as opposed to looking like men in the black suit, I would wear bright yellow, or very bright red, uh, suit that I would just completely stand out, make everybody notice me and still, still be me. So, wow. I hadn't even see there, there you go again with your like just extraordinary mind. I wouldn't even have thought about the attire aspect as something that, you know, to catch attention just for the mere purpose of even initiating a conversation, right? Just for that mere purpose. And that would open a door. That's extraordinary. I love that. What would you say, though, was one of your biggest challenges when it came to walking into this industry and how how did you overcome it? Well, the biggest challenge and and I and I still think it's um, there for me today uh, is how fast our industry is changing. Mm. Um, one that's one of the biggest challenges how fast our industry is changing and technology is coming into the industry so um, we we are no longer just a linguist it's now a combination of language and technology you need to know websites you need to know graphics you need to know um, 
coding, you need to fully understand, you know, you know, machine learning, e-learning. So the whole world is changing and, and language is changing. Our industry is changing with it. So another challenge I would say, so how much you have to learn at all times. It, your, your schooling is never over. I'm, I'm with books every day learning something about uh, wh whatever is the latest thing that, that's going on. Then another challenge I would say is on the outside of our industry, we are still having, uh, within the localization industry, the discussions are how do we elevate the conversation to the C-suite level, right? Within um, interpreting world, uh, we are still dealing with importance and professionalization of interpreters, like educational interpreters, and just now starting, and Natalia Bark is playing a big role in that with, you know, in Orange County, um, of professionalization of educational interpreters. But you think about it, we're in the year 2022. School systems have kind of existed. Uh, people who don't speak other languages, deaf and hard of hearing people have been attending schools. The fact that we're still fighting for the human right to have an interpreter there to help somebody understand is, you know, shows that <clears throat> how, how much, how, how far we've come, but how much further do we have to go? Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, recognition of our industry, professionalization of our industry. I think we're just now kind of starting to, to get to that point. So that's been one of the challenges and then how fast everything is changing and how much you have to learn every day or you want to learn every day in order to, to stay on top of things. You know, I think about all of these things, uh, you know, perhaps to my own detriment uh, consistently and how I can be a part of bringing awareness to each one of these topics um, just by mere having conversations with the professionals that are within the industry. Uh, but yet there's, there's just so much, right? Like, just like in books, like we're so interested in, in so many different topics and we want to, we want to read them all. Leading yourself as a solopreneur is one thing, which many potentially many begin in that way, right? We begin as solopreneurs uh, trying to solve uh, a problem or an issue, but leading a company and leading others, uh, many others in your case, is, is a whole different world. What do you define mindful leadership as and how does that play in a role in your leadership ability? Well, you can be mindful or mindful, right? Uh, full as two separate words with double L. Uh, so you don't want to be mindful with two L's at the end, which is your mind's constantly in the worry word. You want to be mindful, which is one word, which means mindful of your surroundings, which means hiring the team members, every single team member better than you. You wanna hire people who are better than you at whatever it is that uh, they're work going to be working on. Um, the, your team is only as strong as the weakest member. So we are working as, as one team. Um, today, my role has evolved into um, actually working more with the team and making sure everybody is aligned to their highest values or right person, right seat concept, making sure everybody does what they love to do as opposed to what they have to do. Aligning people to their strength is one of Peter Drucker's uh, foundational principles. So that's kind of a lot of what I do within, within the business. And then leading from the point of views as long, uh, if, when you have a situation when every team member is able to shine and uh, is aligned to their strength, um, and uh, th then you're kind of like a conductor of an orchestra where everybody is a master performer. Love that. I've, I've read that uh, at some point uh, with regards to leadership style and, and the orchestra, uh, you know, the conductor that is on stage, basically allowing everybody to play their own tune and, and you're there as a, as a guide to help them accomplish that. For female entrepreneurs, Mila, as we get ready to close our 
just delightful conversations. There's so many things, but I do want to honor your time. For the female entrepreneurs, whatever age or stage they're at, whether they be young and beginning or middle, middle-aged and beginning, what are your recommendations for females specifically in this industry? You mentioned a little bit about it earlier. Let's get out there. But what are those recommendations that you would have that given the opportunity to share and really get in their ear about it, would you say to them? Well, first of all, don't let age um, become something that, oh, I can't do it because I'm this old or I can't do it because I'm this young. Okay. Uh, and, And if you look at it, men don't do that. Men don't define themselves by age as much. It's mostly women. And we're our own kind of biggest self-critic in that way. Age is only whatever is in your mind. And and I've just heard an interview with uh, actually Elon Musk's uh, mother, who is one of the oldest models, 68 or something. She was a model. (laughs) Girl, right? So it's whatever we we define. And um, so let's say now the the beginner, right? So um, don't get, uh, stay focused on the goal where you want to accomplish and just do one thing at a time just that one step at a time. And every day, organize your day by your highest priorities. Look at where you want to get from point A to point B. What are the biggest things that you need to accomplish to get there, that you want to accomplish to get there? And focus your day. Have about between five and seven. Seven is a good number of top priorities you're going to accomplish today, moving towards your bigger goal. And make sure they get done. And if something doesn't get done, it's not how many times we fall, it's how many times we, we get up. What is it, the, the, uh, Thomas uh, Edison, how many times he said 999 ways of not to do the light bulb? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and it took that one correct one to figure out the rest is history, obviously. Right. Thank you so much, Milo, for that. I think that that's super important for anyone at any stage. And and it's true. Uh, As females, we tend to do that uh, when we're young because we're young, when we're older because we're we're too old to start. Or, you know, we've already embarked on something for many years that the thought of having to start over uh, might be scary. And, And if we could tap into the younger self, at least that self that was was fearless or courageous to be able to take that first step. How, how do we channel that? <laughs> I want to give uh, like a, a little bit of advice. You know, we're always so critical talking to ourselves. So self-critical. That self-talk is always kind of like we're, we're, we're our own worst self-critic. But if for a moment you imagine how you would talk to your best friend, if your best friend was trying to start something new at age 30, 40, 50, or, you know, the same self-talk, I'm too young at 18, right? How would you talk to your best friend? And you would be very encouraging and you'd be very supportive. Women are known to be very supportive, very nurturing, very encouraging. So stop yourself in that self-talk. Pause for a moment. Be mindful in that case of your self-talk and then talk to yourself like you would talk to your very best friend. Oh, my gosh. Change that self-talk direction. What a change that would be. I would say... Mila, you're an incredible, phenomenal woman. You got this. Of course, you have what it takes to do it, as opposed to whatever we we tell you. We all do. We all do. Every single one of us is, uh, I believe that every single person has a a genius that we are here to, to bring to the world. I love that so very much. And I imagine guys sitting in a table full of women like Mila sharing stories like this and just having this type of conversation. This is the reason why I tell you that I sat there in awe, just loving my life at that very moment and loving Mila's stories, what she was sharing at the moment. And just knowing that she had to be on the show to come and inspire us to take that first step into whatever it is that we're dreaming about. 
put it in paper. You don't have to take a business class, put it in paper, dream it up, and then just start. Mila, it has been an absolute pleasure having this conversation with you. I wish that we continue at some point having more conversations and inspiring more female entrepreneurs in this very specific language industry to, to be courageous and to take their, their first steps in whatever it is that they want to do or continue. I very much appreciate you and your time. But before we go, please share with us where our listeners can find out more about you and the extraordinary, extraordinary work that you do. I'll, I'll probably, uh, I, I think we're, we're uh, posting some things on our website. Uh, we do, um, well, they can also reach out to me, uh, you know, pretty much at any time. If they can contact um, you for, for your show. And if somebody has additional questions, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, continue the conversation or answer those questions. So if they contact Brand the Interpreter, uh, we can go from there. That's amazing. Are you on LinkedIn, Mila? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I'm also on LinkedIn. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Mila. I very much appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate what you do and uh, highlighting our industry. Absolutely. Thank you for your work.